Can I bid you all a very hearty welcome to our uh, new life service as we get going again after our summer breather. Uh, you're all very welcome and well done for looking at websites and Facebook pages and notice sheets and the like uh, to track down uh, this morning as our start-up time. It's a great pleasure to see you all here and to welcome you to our new life service. Uh, we would love it over the weeks uh, to come if you would, as family units, just take a little moment uh, to fill in a little information sheet that we have at the back of church. It is a pure fact-finding sheet to do with names and addresses and emails to make sure that we are beginning to get a sense of who our New Life congregation are. Uh, please don't all try to do it at once or there'll be a terribly boring queue, but over the next number of weeks, uh, through Carol and through Mel and through Finn and Josh, they'll show you where these multicoloured forms are and if you would take five and fill those in for us, that would be terrific. Now would you all please stand as we come to begin our service. As always, we have some interactive sentences uh, to focus our minds and to focus our hearts on the things of God because He is why we are here. So please join in everything in red print. The heavens declare the glory of God. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us worship and bow down. Let us recount all his wonderful deeds. Well, giving thanks is what's about to happen next in our service. Our first hymn of praise, which is also our collection hymn, so collectors, please be ready to go as soon as we begin to sing a beautiful hymn of praise called Your Name.
everybody. Uh, one of the questions I'm often asked immediately back from holidays is, well, where did you go? What did you do? And all of that. Did you have a good time? Uh, but some of you will actually get around to asking me, well, Mark, what great, what great discovery did you make? You know, Church of Ireland minister, when on holiday, you're supposed to be reflecting deeply. You're supposed to be reading all the time. You're supposed to be praying your socks off. And to come back refreshed with a great truth, a great new discovery. And I have one. I have one. And it's this. Why on earth did you have what you want on a pizza? I, I love lots of different things. And, and, and I just think it would be brilliant if you were able to put all of those things all at once in a pizza. Because pizza is like one of the best kinds of, of food ever. And this morning that's exactly what I'm going to ask the kids here to, to help me do. To make a mad pizza. We've got the bases ready to go. Uh, Mel and Finn uh, uh, and the guys are going to come up to the front now and start uncovering the bits. And guys, there are amazing things. They happen to be some of the things that I like. There's no nuts up near the front at all, uh, but there's fizzy cola bottles. Uh, there's, there's chopped onions. Uh, there's blueberries. Uh, there's barbecue chicken. There's chocolate-covered raisins. There's all sorts of things. And I think just... Is when you come up and I'm not going to bring it on or bad and water, just on your own, take a couple of spoonfuls of the things that you really like and let's make ourselves a crazy pizza. We well, maybe ask Cheryl to do some diddly diddly music just as we're making a pizza. So, Cheryl, no pressure, but some Italian themed pizza making music would be really good. I'm not joking. Just, just a wee thing. So, folks, adults, kids, come on up. Discover the pizza toppings. Make yourselves a crazy pizza. Where are the chocolate onions? Spooned on, want? come on. Bit of bacon, good girl. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this is interesting. I'm going to do some. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh.
I've always thought that they needed sprinkles. Yes, well, yes. Good girl. Right, Bria, come on and sit down there. Watch the steps as you go down the lock. Wow. They are quite spectacular. Yeah, they are. Oh, yeah. Some of the children in Ballymena have very strange diets from the pizzas now. Now, these are going to be cooked, these pizzas. And God willing, next Sunday morning, there will be pizza slices for everybody, if you're brave enough to eat them. So what's this all about, Mark? Pizzas and all sorts of crazy mixed up pizzas. And the toppings in our pizzas would really provoke the question, would you really swallow that? Would you really swallow that? And watch out Facebook and our, our, our website, you'll see pictures of our glorious pizzas in the week to come. Uh, before they're cooked and brought back next Sunday. Do you know, in life, in, in our thinking about God and people and the world, we are asked to believe so many different things. And then we can easily get mixed up. And we're asking ourselves the question, in new life services, in these next number of weeks, do we really swallow that? Do we really believe that? What do we believe? And we're going to be travelling through major themes in the Old Testament part of the Bible to try and learn from them and bring them to life and to have a new confidence in, in what we should believe the truth to be. So our kids have helped us this morning. They've created a pizza that might be a bit difficult to swallow, the fizzy cola bottles and the chocolate sprinkles over the crispy onions. I'm really looking forward to trying that. Um, but come next Sunday for your slice of pizza. And keep that theme in the back of your heads. Do I really swallow that? As Davis and I and others uh, bring a little bit of teaching week by week. We're going to stand and sing uh, a song, uh, not just for the kids, but for us all. Uh, it talks about uh, our God being a great big God. There's actions to this song. Just where you are, you don't need to come out of your pews this morning. Just where you are, teach the grown-ups around you what the actions are. Uh, and some of the guys up here, they're not playing guitars or drums, will also uh, play, uh, do some of the actions. So let's all stand as we sing. Our God is a great big God. <laughs>
and everybody. We're going to uh, continue our service in a, a word of prayer. And again, there's responsive parts to these prayers. Today sees the start of our Sunday school. And the kids will shortly be going out uh, to Sunday school as we get going again. And so very much at the heart of this prayer, and just after this prayer, we want to pray for our children. We want to pray for our Sunday school helpers and our Sunday school teachers in the term that lies ahead. But let's pray together. Heavenly Father, from our hearts we thank you for this new day. May we spend it in your service. Our tongues, that we speak no false or angry word. Lord, keep us from wrong speaking. Our actions, that we do nothing to shame ourselves or hurt others. Lord, keep us from wrongdoing. Our minds, that we may think no cruel or bitter thoughts. Lord, keep us from wrong thinking. Our hearts, that we may be set only on pleasing you. Lord, keep us in your love for all that we have done wrong in thought, word, and action. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Lord, we pray for Lucy and Alan and the guy and everybody involved in Sunday school in these weeks that lie ahead. We know it will be a busy time. We pray it will be a fun time. We pray it will be a time of discovery and growth for our children and young people. Not just physical growth or intellectual growth as school and courses and classes change and begin, but growth in knowledge and understanding and love and uh, following of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Christian faith. All these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We're going to ask you to stand now and we're going to sing our next worship song. Uh, it may be a new one to some of you in the congregation, the Lion and the Lamb. To that end, the guys at the front are going to sing the first verse and the chorus through to let us tune in. Then they will start from the beginning again. And during the singing of this hymn, the young people and the teachers may head to Sunday school. So let's all stand and learn together the lion and the lamb.
sorry, my slide work wasn't with it there. I wanted to change it, but I lost a wee bit. But, um, I don't know about you, but I was asked already about three times there, I sat beside my kids, if we're going to have pizza tonight. <laughs> I said, can we go to Domino's, Domino's, Domino's. There's a tomato puree here, and the best food smells of onions. But that's, that's church life for you. Uh, I'm going to pray shortly with you now before we have our Bible reading. Uh, our Bible reading is from Genesis, the first few verses of the Bible. And uh, it's important that we pray before we read God's Word. Let's pray. Lord God, Father in heaven, as we look at these familiar verses, these mighty verses uh, that talk about the beginning of time, Lord be with us this day. Speak to us. May your Holy Spirit be at work in each of our hearts and minds. We want to draw closer to you, Lord God. Help us do that this day. In Jesus' name we pray. So our scripture is just the first five verses uh, of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. And they go like this. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Amen. That is the beginning. That is the very first words of scripture that we have that explain how God created the world. The biblical version of creation. From Genesis 1, it gets a bit of a tough, tough rap in our world, in our society. It's not taken too seriously in the world around us. And because the world doesn't take it too seriously, quite often the church doesn't sing too loud about it. It tends to downplay it a little bit. It might not shout it around uh, the houses too much. Genesis, creation, biblical creation, as something the Christian might whisper about, as opposed to shout about. And what is it that causes us to keep our voice down, to not say too much? Well, Mark touched on it with, with the pizza idea. He's making a point. And the point he's making is that the amount of alternative messages that are out there, alternative to this bit of scripture from Genesis, are so well ingrained and so plentiful. Even as adults, they're so numerous that, they're, that they confuse us. But the real answer is they can't all be right. They can't all be swallowed, as Mark would say. And I'm going to touch on a few of those today, those ideas or questions, things that hold us back. Uh, but I really want to keep bringing us back to this idea that in this very basic way that the, that the Christian message of creation and how it started has far, far more to offer than many of all the theories and all the uh, ideas out there of how we began. I want to suggest that the Christian message of a world created by a good God uh, is actually a reasonable idea. And actually more, more when we think about it, it's pretty clear and pretty obvious. The Christian message of creation is pretty reasonable, obvious, so, creation. Sorry, that's the idea of this child trying to swallow these big ideas. In the beginning, God, the first thing we're told in Scripture, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I can remember as a wee person uh, asking that question. As many of all you probably had the same question. Um, before God created everything, what was there? What was there before God created all that. And uh, kids really have all the, the most difficult questions. They have all the, the, the most powerful questions. And as we get, as we get older and adults, we stop, we stop, we don't get a good answer to them, we just stop asking those questions. But actually, if you speak to children about these things, the questions are still real and, and um, are so valid. Um, and they need some, some sort of answer, at least something to think about. 
If God created everything at one point in time, what was there before that? It can't have been nothing, surely. Well, one of the first things that we're told about in, in science, um, first things that science asks us to swallow in a way, is that the universe has actually started with a big bang. You've all heard that Bing Bang theory, and we're just talking about the, the comedy show. Um, because scientists worked out that the, when they looked at the universe and the stars, they worked out that everything is expanding, everything is sort of moving out, getting further and further away from itself. And really, therefore, most of all came over time back from one point, one point in time. Stephen Hawkins said, almost everyone believes now, he says, that the universe, time, began with the Big Bang. And so there must have been this single origin point uh, at which there was a Big Bang, uh, a, a mysterious bang, and everything came from that. Everything came out in some sort of random, evolving, uh, uh, unpurposeful way. And they thought, well, that just proves God. If you compare that to Genesis, then it's not in there. Therefore, that would prove God, except Except if you accept that there was a single source, a single point in time at which the universe was, was started off, everything started from this point, it sounds a bit too much like, actually, something had to start that. Something outside of our universe had to start that little big bang. If it was, as scientists believe, two planets smashing together and then there's a big bang and then all this chemical reactions and, and things start to happen and then eventually we form. If that's the case, something had to form those planets and smash together. Something had to smash them together. If there's such a thing as a big bang, there has to be a big banner. You're all imagining the big saucers now. <laughs> Something had to kick it off if there was a big bang to begin with. And that all sounds a bit too much like in the beginning God created. That all sounds a bit too much obvious. And so the scientists, when they realize that all this is a bit too close to there being a creator God, clicking things off from go. The latest theory that scientists have now is uh, I'm not going to get very technical today, but is, is the multiverse. The multiverse, which is a theory that there's not just one universe, there's infinite numbers of universes, multiverses. So there's not just one version of us here in this church inside a the universe, there's another version. There's a version with me, with who's eight foot tall and a green head. And there's a version where just Carl is not there. So the scientists are starting to say, now, well, if, all, if there's all these multiverses, all these universes, uh, how can there be one God, one creator? But there's no proof of any of that. That's just a theory. And so we need to ask ourselves, well, um, we're supposed to swallow that, that there's infinite versions of us and different infinite universes. That's how we get around it. How much faith does that sort of thing need for us to believe? How much faith do we need to believe something as radical as that? just so we can discount Genesis over belief in one good God, one creator. The next thing that they try to follow us, and I talk about they, I tend to be talking about atheists, about scientific people who don't believe in God, who don't really want to accept that there's a good God, and they might actually have rules that they have to live by. The one thing, the next thing we're asked to swallow is that the world around us is, is a result of random happen, happenings. It basically all fell into place randomly. Uh, it all sort of evolved the universe from some sort of microscopic nothing, basically. It started off as, well, we don't know what it started off, but it was microscopic, and now it's, it's done things, formed, molded, and we are aware. And that idea is that atheists would say that there's no purpose in this evolution, what we are with today. It was a purposeless uh, randomness, all chance. Everything came together by chance, and it's all purposelessness. So what we have now, 
has, has randomly come together. There's no intelligent creator. And if we have something around us that's physical, that's real, that just came there by chance. And there's nothing at the start. So how is that to swallow? Is that another difficult thing to swallow? One of the main key laws in science and even in philosophy is that um, something always comes from something. Okay? Nothing cannot create something. You can't get something from nothing. People argue about creation all the time, but if you ask anyone this question, do you believe that there's anything around you at all now? Is there anything physically around you? And they say yes. Well then, if there's something now, then there always has to have been something, because something can't come from nothing. If you have a vacuum, a, a, a cube, say, and there's nothing in it, it's a, there's no air or anything in it, and it's airtight, if you come back to that in a hundred years, there'll still be nothing inside it. There'll not be a wee bird. If you come back in a billion years, there'll still be nothing in there. Something can't come from nothing. It's the most obvious thing in the world when you think about it. There must have always been something, always. There was never a time when there was nothing. That's impossible. Because you can't go from nothing to something. There must have always been something, so that we now have something. So we're told that everything around us, there's something that is around us that we all see and touch and feel and uh, all the stuff we have came from nothing. It can't have. There must always have been something. Before the start of the world, before creation, there must always have been something. There must have been something to start something. And I wonder, was that something God? Another thing that has been found in, um, by scientists, they've discovered as well, is that the universe is so finely tuned, okay, and I'm not trying to get technical here, so finely tuned in terms of nature, in terms of physics, um, it's so finely calibrated. And if, say, the speed of light is, is a, a millionth of a second slower or faster, or the strength of gravity is a millionth of a degree smaller, then they've discovered that this all would, this wouldn't hold together. Nothing that we have would actually be here. There'd be no stars, no light, no planets, no chemistry. They found when they look at the universe and these equations that hold everything together that everything is so finely tuned. So finely calibrated that it won't shift to the left or right and nothing would exist. It's like a machine with loads of knobs and, and, and dials and they're all, there's millions of them, they're all set to the right setting and if one of them's out, the whole thing goes out the window. Sounds a bit like our sound desk <laughs> at the back. I'll tell this joke to the 11.30 guys, they'll have harder because they're tortured with it. The sound desk has its own, uh, its own mysterious spirit inside of that thing sometimes. But if we tweak even slightly some of these things, organic life wouldn't exist. We have a fine tuned universe, and Stephen Hawking, again, who's not a Christian, he said we have so finely tuned the universe that you can't explain its beginnings without the act of a God who intended to create beings like us. We were intended to be this way. We're so finely tuned, we're so intricate, that it must have been designed in such a way. And again, the best way around this sort of fine tuning is this multiverse idea that there's other universes that aren't finely tuned but work somehow, and we just happen to be this perfect version of it. So, Another hard, difficult thing to swallow. Another thing that's hard to swallow in my book as well is the world that we have around us, the beauty and the wonder that we see. Again, we're told to accept that that's all just by chance and just fell in place lovingly. There's a bit in Romans which says that God has made himself, we're told, uh, 
plain to all of us. The things about God have been shown to us already, Scripture says. So Romans 1 20 says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. I, uh, I love uh, kingfishers, uh, uh, the birds. When I was wee, I really took to them and I just love kingfishers as birds. I think they're, they're beautiful. And uh, this is a picture I found of a kingfisher just going into uh, a river or a lake and he's about to catch a fish and it's just at that split second where he's about to pierce the water. And uh, the photographer who took that picture, uh, it took him six months of being stationed up trying to get that spot and watching the kingfisher do it. To me, I, I find that image beautiful. I, I think that's a wonderful image. Uh, I don't look at that and think my brain just thinks that's a bird getting the fish. There's something more going on in me, in my heart, in my soul, that has wonder in that. Uh, a beautiful bird just uh, doing that action. We have within each of us a wonder of uh, a sense of what beauty is and creation around us. Psalm 139 has this wonderful line. Uh, which just says, Wonderful are your works, says the Lord. My soul knows it well. Wonderful are your works, Lord. My soul knows it well. A, a beautiful landscape, uh, the stars at night, a painting, a kingfisher. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My brain just, my brain doesn't look, we don't look at the landscape and think, Oh, that's right, there's a blue streak and then a green, but that must be the ground. Very nice. There's something, our brains just still go, look at those different colours, interesting. There's something within us, on a soul level, that connects with that. That sees a part of creation there in front of us, and something within us. And if we think that creation was designed by God, and we were designed by God, is there something we connect with there? Something that's real, something that's of God. Creation for many of us can give us a, a wonder, uh, can fill us with a joy and a hope. We have this connection with creation at a soul level. The last wee topic I'm going to look at now is uh, something that's called intelligent design. Again, I'm not going to get too technical. Intelligent design. Which basically says that there are things that we look at in the life around us, in the world around us, in nature. And when we see them, we think, wow. And when we look at them closely, under a microscope or whatever, we find that they're so complicated, so beautifully put together, that they must have been put together by some intelligence, some intelligent designer. Things are so complicated that it has to be Designed. This is uh, an image of Mount Rushmore. I keep going to call it Rushmere, but that's a pretty good idea. Mount Rushmore. So these are the four, four key presidents. Uh, when we look at that, uh, even though it's theoretically possible, somebody could say to us, look at that picture, uh, that all happened by chance. Even though it's theoretically possible that that mountain and those they all form just by chance that they happen to look like those presidents. Even though that's possible, none of us are going to believe that those faces in that rock landed there by chance. All of us know when we look at that and go, right, a team of people designed that and they took a picture of Washington and they tried to, tried to replace it on that. Those rocks, rocks look like they're designed. They can't have been there by chance. They must have been designed. Uh, in the same way, if uh, you were to walk into my, or I was to walk into your living room and you had a new flat screen TV, or maybe the husband and wife, and the husband goes to the wife, where's this TV come from? And the wife says, well, no, I didn't buy it, it just appeared and formed together and just arrived there. Even though it's so intricately designed, someone must have designed it, made it, and you had to pay for it. So when we see things in nature then, far more intricate, far more complex than a couple of faces on a mountain, far more complex than a TV, 
then we wonder who designed this. Who designed this? There's a wee thing in the human body, it's called the flagellum. It's the right name. And its job in our, it's a microscopic thing, and its job in our body is to shoot uh, proteins around the body. And it's microscopic. Uh, uh, but it has a rotary engine, and it can have different gears. And it rotates it at 40 times per millisecond or something like this. And when you see wee things like that, you think that is so uh, intricately designed, such an intelligent piece of work, that it's hard to believe that that just landed by chance. There are things that are called irreducibly complex, okay, which means, in a nutshell, uh, something is so complex in its design that if you took one part out of it, it would just fall apart. It's just too intricately complex. So that's the argument against evolution in a way that you can't evolve to that point because anything, any other form of that would fall apart. Any less complex form of that would fall apart. Getting too technical. Isn't it? But generally, there are things that are so complex in science, in our nature, uh, that they can't have come about by chance. And I could go on really uh, about different aspects, but the uneasiness that there is uh, with the idea of a biblical God, uh, the biblical creation is so strong that intelligent people can ignore a lot of the stuff I've talked about. But we can ignore the obviousness of a big bang having to have a creator starting it off. The obviousness that uh, there could never have been nothing, there must always have been something. So before us there must still have been something and that must have been God. Chance can't create anything. A creator can create things. The obviousness, scientists at least, that life is so finely tuned. The obviousness that the world around us is so wonderful and so beautiful and there's this connection in our heart and soul level. Why is it so beautiful? Why were we not all just a bunch of grey blobs? You know, why have we got this beauty? Why have we got this overabundant world to enjoy, to be in awe of? Maybe scripture is given it something when it says uh, God has been evident to us since creation. And the obviousness of intelligent design, the obvious of intricateness, complexity that's in us. So there are many things, I hope, some of these arguments today, uh, you might find some of them compelling, some of them not so, but combined there's a weight to them. Is there not? There's a weight to all this uh, that should do something to suggest that the existence of a creator God, at the very least, uh, should be something that we hold on to, something that we don't dismiss. And to take it further, it might so happen that the very explanation we have in front of us, that we have of a good creator, makes actually the most sense. Maybe it just is the way it was down in the Bible. Um, we're going to be looking at Genesis over the next uh, four or five weeks, so it's not just today. So there's, there's other things that we can, if we take this bit of scripture seriously, there's other things that we can glean, or glean from this. Um, the idea that we're made in the image of God, the idea that comes from Genesis that we were designed to work, to design things, to create, to get enjoyment of that. The idea that we should take a Sabbath rest and that's actually good for us. So we're going to be looking at those sorts of things over the next weeks uh, as we look at creation before we move on to other parts of the Old Testament uh, that seriously. So really I want to suggest if we get look at this seriously we might start to find things ringing true and we might start to find that things fit how we're made in God's image etc. Right, we're just going to clo close now in prayer, and then we're going to have uh, our final hymn before that. Let's pray. Lord God, Father in heaven, uh, we have the scriptures before us. We have your basic beginnings 
uh, at the start of Genesis that lead us point towards a good God who created us in his image. Lord, help us, uh, not just today, but in the weeks ahead, look at Genesis and look at your creation afresh. Help us be open, Lord, to, to your um, telling of the story. And help us hold at bay for a while at least all the theories that are out there, Lord, that conflict with that. Lord, give us an openness to your word. And may your Holy Spirit be working us this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're about to stand and sing our closing hymn. Uh, the Lord is my salvation. Please stand.
Right, folks, thank you again. Good to see you again. Back and go over and have a coffee and enjoy yourself uh, for five or ten minutes before you head off. Before you pick up the